You just have to think of a horrible thing and poof! Ah! You become it! The Flying Dutchman is a great character. And Plankton is a great character. So how come we have yet to see a great episode between the two until now? I mean, yeah, they are both antagonists often in episodes, but considering that Plankton is both a villain and a friend depending on circumstance, you can make a lot of great episodes between the two. I feel like the chemistry is there. So in today's verses, we're gonna look at two episodes that deal with the Flying Dutchman. Also plug in my Discord. <laughs> We start out with a really good introduction to the episode. I feel like including ghosts, especially with the shots they took, showing at least an intermediate knowledge on the framing of horror movies and horror shows, made this look very different from the Spongebob episodes we usually see. <laughs> Get her, Grandma! I don't know if you're the one who should be saying things like that, Plankton. The last time your grandma was in this situation, you did not come out of it looking great. So Plankton says the name of the episode and gets an idea. If he turns into a ghost, he will be able to slip into the Krusty Krab and get the formula. It's such a brilliant idea. Why hasn't he thought of this sooner? I also appreciate the way this was presented using a monochromatic technologic presentation of a Plankton sprite getting the formula. This episode seems to be going great so far. All right, that's it. You ruined another movie night with your secret formula garbage. I'm pulling the plug. I'd imagine you want to keep suicide as far away from Plankton as possible, but who am I kidding? Is anyone really upset that there's one less Karen in the world? And apologies to any Karen that's subscribed, I'm not talking about you guys at all. And to any Karens that aren't subscribed but are watching me, come on, like, come on. Also, you would think for a WIFE, she'd go into sleep mode or go do anything else besides turn herself off if we are to believe that she's pretty much a sentient being with her own intelligence. So if Karen committing suicide, Plankton also trans transfers the ghost out of him, keeping his corpse there to decompose, I suppose. Anyone who's walking in there is going to be immediately traumatized, unless it's Mr. Krabs, who would probably pay while his funeral. As I've said in mostly, I think, all the season 8 reviews I've done so far, I'm on the side that enjoys the cartoony nature of it. It's not going to surpass how I feel about the first 3 or 4 seasons, however, it's a nice change of pace. And considering how in this climate, we don't have that many cartoons that are super wacky, cartoony, and then also successful, I figure I'll take what I can get. So Plankton, cautious and all, phases through the chum bucket's front door successfully. Gaining the confidence that his machine actually works, he rushes towards the Krusty Krab, grabs the formula, crushes Mr. Krabs, and takes over the world. Actually, he gets into the safe and realizes that he can't pick up the bottle. Now, maybe Plankton had this higher thought and saw that when the grandma in the movie was on the other side of the door, there was clearly someone banging against the door, and thought that ghosts, in fact, can pick up non-ghost-like objects, and technically he's correct. I would wonder exactly how he'd be able to get it out of the safe from that point on though. It seems like a better idea to just be a ghost and figure out the combination. So seemingly out of nowhere, we get the Flying Dutchman laughing at the latest ghost of Bikini Bottom failing miserably. After Plankton cries and whines, the Flying Dutchman realizes that he enjoys watching a man whine and takes him under his wing. I can teach you how to pick things up. Hey, I love you. But first, you need to learn the basics of being a ghost. Pretty solid structure that allows for a lot of comedy, especially since we have two of the funniest recurring characters playing the lead role here. Plankton is generally on the receiving end of a planned backfiring, general pain, or when his quips fly over SpongeBob's head. And even though he's playing the role of the mentee here, he's technically still on the receiving end, as a lot of the comedy is set up from him trying to be a ghost. I love it, and I'm still perplexed on how it took over a decade, nearly two, for an episode like this to be made. As they go off and learn the ways of a proper ghost, let's start off Shanghai. So, fun fact, this is not your average episode, it was actually a 17 minute long special in which Patchy the Pirate was shown to announce a poll that let people decide the end of the episode, but only right before it was going to happen. Although now we see a largely censored and or truncated version of this, before I would imagine that this was a big deal. It's calling in vote time! You get to choose how our cartoon ends today, via the phone or the internet if you're technologically inclined. It seems almost revolutionary now, despite having very little memory about it. I wouldn't imagine any company having the budget to do this with anything besides 
Spongebob, ironically. So if there were three endings that people can vote for, Spongebob, Squidward's, and Patrick's ending in this particular instance, I would think it's pretty obvious who would win that. However, I do wonder if it was fixed. I mean, it'd be weird in a show called Spongebob Squarepants to have Spongebob not win the vote, but at the same time, it'd be weird to fix a vote just to make that happen. Since the initial airing of this episode, March 9th, 2001, this specific version hasn't been aired since. It seems pretty significant too, to have a sponsor being Milk. <laughs> Oh, that's not good. Good milk. They even had promotional art of this specific episode. You have this photo here, which shows another name of this episode being You Wish. It seems pretty significant, yet very little people actually talk about this part. It's also interesting because when I get asked what's my favorite Spongebob episode, I point to a lot of episodes, including Big Birthday Blowout, which I did talk about. But this is one as well, and I want to show you why. So it's a regular day for Spongebob, except rather than getting ripped off by a low pay at the Krusty Krab, he's getting ripped off by a cereal box that gives him no prize. Don't worry Spongebob, give it 10 or 20 years and no cereal box is cool enough to actually try that and give something awesome that doesn't require an app to download. There's certain things about this old aesthetic that I like that I can actually name as there's a general feel towards the earlier episodes that I can't really put my finger on. For one, the Hawaiian-esque music gives it a tropical feel for being underwater, alongside Spongebob dumping out all the cereal to hear this jug sort of sound effect to indicate that it's empty. It gives a very natural, almost nautical feel. Speaking of, a giant anchor drops down and what does Spongebob do? Gather the crew, obviously. This was back when Spongebob wasn't animated, not in a literal sense, but in the figurative sense, where his actions were exaggerated to give him a feel of being boisterous and super emotive, wearing his emotions on his sleeve in a comical and outlandish way. But here, he was capable of being more than happy, sad, and cocaine. You've done. We didn't do it, Squidward. Our hands are clean. Clean. So obviously, as a way to get Squidward up on top of the ship alongside SpongeBob and Patrick, this was not a bad way to go about it. I just wish that they closed the door. Like I hate that, and I very, very rarely use that word. Do not, under any circumstances, do this. Never leave anybody's door open. That's like the most disrespectful thing you can do. I also appreciate the continuity in keeping Squidward's left, our right, window open. Spongebob and the crew start climbing up the ship, and Patrick calls out Spongebob for potentially living in a fantasy world. This is the same starfish that lost a quarter and sat on a stationary seahorse for god knows how long. So as they climb up, it turns into a darker sky, which is a great touch, as well as the music changing to something more ominous. The ship glows green, as Spongebob tries to remember who owns the ship. At first, it seems like dad humor, exactly my type of humor. Doesn't this place seem familiar? I don't know. Why? I don't know. Doesn't it just kind of ring a bell? Yes! But I chose to see it a little deeper than that. This would not be his first experience with the Flying Dutchman, nor our first experience of the Flying Dutchman. However, it'd be the Flying Dutchman's first significant role within the series. His first appearance was in Squidward the Unfriendly Ghost, in a magazine cameo. However, alongside appearing in Scaredy Pants towards the end, Arg towards the end, and Your Shoes Untied as one of the people who Spongebob sought to fix his problem, these are all minor and in some instances, tangential appearances, and if we are to believe that the first episode leads into other episodes, considering that Spongebob gets his job in episode 1 so certain episodes like Scaredy Pants wouldn't make sense, I can totally believe that he has yet to meet the Flying Dutchman and only see him in passing. I may be looking deeply into it, but you know that's why I have as many subscribers as I do. While I rambled on, I do want to note that Squidward is banging on the door yelling at the top of his octopus lungs and ringing the doorbell repeatedly, ghosts or not, it's completely justified to be very mad and upset at someone just not being patient at all. Granted, Squidward's house was shanked dark alleyway style, so I understand. So we have a lot of great things happen here, between the faces that Spongebob and Patrick make, Squidward getting zapped both for being snarky and for being Squidward, and the Flying Dutchman saying that because because Spongebob and his friends came aboard the ship uninvited, according to the ghost pirate rules, they must now be a part of his crew forever. Fun fact though, the Flying Dutchman mentions his mother when the four of them were trying to figure out what Squidward was saying before he came aboard the ship, and we actually do get to see the Flying Dutchman's mother. No really, in the comics at least. So before we set off to become a ghost crew, let's continue on with the Ghost of Plankton. Getting back over to the Ghost of Plankton, they start off with something really easy, shapeshifting. You just have to 
think of a horrible thing and poof! You be coming! Now you're probably wondering why the Flying Dutchman shape shifted into Pearl at the end. Well, I'd like to believe that because Plankton is afraid of whales, that's why he did it. And this is a whale that we can identify with. However, considering the pull the plug joke and Plankton literally rolling up his own corpse, I feel like all of this is semi-referencing One Course Meal. A very polarizing episode within the community, considering that that story kind of led up to Plankton contemplating to pull his plug. Not horrible! What were you thinking? Bad girl! He's off the scare now, leading into one of the more concrete jokes I felt throughout the episode. It has a few consistencies, such as Plankton always getting hit, indicating that the next lesson comes up, and the Flying Dutchman showing this guy a situation where he's about to step on a cockroach and it flies, and he literally exits the earth. It's well animated and it shows that Spongebob is getting better at animating exaggerated but creative reactions. I also love the environment here, because it's unique, and I'm always up for establishing more spots than your boating schools, Krusty Krabs, and Goo Lagoons. So they do take the easy joke out, no not scaring someone who's big and tough, but Plankton and scaring himself. Even though that was a no-brainer, I still like the way he sort of hulked up and became a scarier version of himself. I like the consistency of him exiting this earth one organ system at a time, and I also like the chemistry between Plankton and the Flying Dutchman. Once again, it feels like we should have gotten this a long time ago. Our next lesson is haunting houses, which seems like a ghost thing to do, but I feel like that's just scaring again. Alright pupil, it's time to apply all you've learned and frighten this guy's legs off. Ah yes, who can forget the possessing class? Or the ghost goo class? I guess it's one of those educations where some of the lessons are free but the rest are behind a paywall. So Plankton does a great job and Squidward does a great job with his reactions, pretty much creating a solid scene. However, I begin to notice this episode has some faults and it becomes pretty apparent here. Whereas in the beginning it's boom, quick, we gotta bring in Karen, okay next thing we bring Plankton to the vault, what's the next thing, shape shifting, then scaring, on and on and on like that. We come to a grinding halt, for seemingly no reason other than they kinda wanted to get in more Squidward jokes before they get on with the story. And I feel like once Plankton scared Squidward, that's it, the story should naturally move on to the next lesson. But it takes some more time. We do get one of those highly rendered drawings that Spongebob puts in from time to time. I love how on the last lesson, picking things up, they had to specify that this lesson. This lesson is the last lesson. For all you kids who feel like this episode is taking forever, this lesson is the last lesson. Don't worry. This also goes into a major problem I have, but I want to save that for the biggest offender within this episode. So the Flying Dutch explains how Plankton was able to pick things up earlier, which I guess was the justification for staying in Squidward's house for so long. As you discovered, to pick things up, you gotta get really angry! Imagine telling Plankton that he needs to get angry to do something, and that's why he hasn't been able to do that thing until now. This is Plankton we're talking about. Plankton asks exactly what the audience would ask, and returns the favor of hitting Dutchman over the head, making him proud for some reason. I think a villain in villain scenario like this works wonders, because none of the villains are so evil that it would be seen as too unlikable for children. Plankton, while a villain, his character is nice enough to coexist with the people that he claims to hate. And the Flying Dutchman, while more of an evil or neutral character, plays as the perfect person to coexist with Plankton, letting Plankton play the role of the protagonist for a change. Plus like with Sandy, it seems like their interests line up heavily that you can create cool, fresh, and a new dynamic that isn't just another Plankton Steals the Formula episode. With this, I was also able to see Plankton as a ghost and Plankton and the Flying Dutchman, which to me makes it feel a little bit more refreshing. Now before we get over to Plankton using his newfound skills to get the formula, let's continue on with Shanghai. So tossing Squidward in the fly of despair for about 7 minutes leaves a good chunk of this episode dealing with the dynamic of Spongebob, Patrick, and the Flying Dutchman. Unlike the Ghost of Plankton where there's a level of playfulness from the Flying Dutchman, here while he may be seen as calm or snide in certain moments, he reaffirms his status as a captain, often through aggression. Which you can see when Spongebob and Patrick can't even clean a ship without being yelled at. One of the core reasons I enjoy this episode so much is because there's never a moment in it that I don't consider to be nearly flawless. Yeah, I'm jumping on a ledge with that one, there's always room for improvement of course, but let's take this next scene. They're off to do some late night haunting all throughout Bikini Bottom, howling to set the seven seas ablaze with fear. And you probably already know where this is going. 
even start here? I mean, it's definitely iconic because of Patrick who up to this point has just been vibing in the background, taking a backseat to either Squidward's snide and torment, or Spongebob's obliviousness being worked into the main comedic vehicle. But just like a sniper, it may be the slowest of the pack, but it sure packs a punch when you hit dead on. It's almost silly to describe why myself and tons of people find this hilarious. I think part of it is the Flying Dutchman with his hand bent and this face that I would get if I saw a kid rolling around on the floor throwing a tantrum at a JCPenney. But the other part is that while the Flying Dutchman is a legitimate ghost and he wants a crew to scare, the dynamic of working with such an oblivious crew will only lead to disaster. And it's up to the writers to make sure that it's an entertaining disaster and not a frustrating one. Because the line for so is pretty clear, at least to anyone who's ever worked on a group project at school before. Captain, there's a guy we can scare. I had four biscuits and I ate one. Then I only had three. I'm not sure if he's saying he ate one biscuit of his four and now he's saying he has three biscuits left or if he ate one biscuit out of the four then he had the other three and he's like oh I only had three. Flying Dutchman with the pure Chris Hansen bait relishes in the enjoyment of seeing the kids out after dark and we get another iconic joke. Take us behind those rocks. Moving behind the rocks. Captain, we'll buff out those scratches. Maybe I'm a pure Neanderthal and the sound of drill and wood flying everywhere is the funniest thing on earth, but every time this scene comes on I can't help but chuckle a little bit because of how optimistic Spongebob looks as he's absolutely destroying the ship. We already see that the Flying Dutchman is tired of the crew and it's not even nearing the end of the episode yet. Like with the Ghosts of Plankton, we're also scaring people, because that's what ghosts do, except Casper, I think? Whereas the other episode has a similar scene with Plankton basically scaring himself, I like this better, because it doesn't seem as on the nose. The Flying Dutchman brings out his ghost crew to scare this kid with no preparation, and mind you, Spongebob and Patrick are not ghosts, they're completely sentient, and are essentially counting on them, Spongebob and Patrick, to come up with something scary. I also love the performance of Spongebob when he, alongside Patrick, missed their initial cue. The Flying Dutchman is building up this menacing scare, mind you, after he already scared this biscuit-eating child. I really don't know what he was thinking Spongebob and Patrick can do to top that. And while the joke is essentially repeated, it never gets repetitive because each time, it's a different aspect of why this would never work. He tries to scare a woman and they use bubbles and a foil to show that they're internally way too nice to think of something evil to do. The next time he tries to scare Larry, who I'm surprised did not have a heart attack considering the intense workouts that he does anyway, and Spongebob and Patrick fail because they aren't ghosts and they still collide with objects. Then lastly, it cements on their lack of usefulness by showing the Flying Dutchman able to spin his head and the duo turning that into ice skating of all things to show that they're way too silly to come up with something menacing. To me, it's genius. It's simple, but it has purposefulness. The easy but wrong way to do this, to me, would be to basically portray Spongebob and Patrick to be unbelievable unbelievably stupid. Like for example, having Spongebob try to scare someone and in the process get scared of Patrick and then they do this loop where they get scared by each other. Or something like Patrick being a glutton and leaning on him eating something as a ghost or not being able to eat something as a ghost. To me that screams lazy and without a purpose and considering that it serves as a great contrast against the Flying Dutchman who again is legitimate, when he scares someone he has the act down, the voice down, and the manipulation of weather down perfectly. So the dynamic here works. You know the drill, back to the ghost of Plankton. So do you remember what I said a while ago? Now maybe Plankton had this higher thought and saw that when the grandma in the movie was on the other side of the door, there was clearly someone banging against the door and thought that ghosts in fact can pick up non-ghost like objects and technically he's correct. I would wonder exactly how he'd be able to get it out of the safe from that point on though. Well I kinda called it. Being predictable actually isn't an issue, but what is an issue is what happens after that. 
Plankton straight up tosses the Dutchman aside and wants to go back into his old body. I feel like this was an extension to the story that hasn't been properly set up, because the rest of this episode has to do with Plankton getting back into his body. We've seen several episodes that don't return characters back to their normal or original state, and we can chalk it up to, well, it's a cartoon. They'll be back to normal in the next episode, especially because Spongebob is episodic. Not this episode. This episode, they really, really want you to know that Plankton can and will go from being Plankton to a ghost and now back to Plankton for some odd reason. And I feel like a giant chunk of potential in this episode has been lost. Honestly, I would want Plankton and the Flying Dutchman to build up more to their falling out, showing that their personalities clash too much for them to be a stable pair. Rather than Plankton bowing out and now spending three minutes trying to get back into his body. Maybe if they built up that if Plankton doesn't get back into his body in a set amount of time, then it would have made more sense to dedicate nearly a third or a fourth of this episode to essentially reaffirming the status quo. Did you expect to have people question if Plankton wouldn't be normal in the next episode? Some characters have blown up before. I think Plankton will be just fine. Now granted, this may be my bias towards a Dutchman and Plankton dynamic, so take this with a grain of salt. So what do they spend the rest of this episode going on about? And now, if anyone has anything nice to say about Sheldon, this would be the time. <laughs> Shh. Um, Plankton was small and, and green and loud! <laughs> Ah, okay, so that's why Karen had to be unplugged. Okay, so this all is starting to make sense, but imagine having more people at your funeral than at your restaurant when you were alive. SpongeBob is the only person here who I believe is acting out of good faith. Like, do you know any of these people? Have you seen any of these people talk to Plankton before? Do they even know who Plankton is? Were they paid to be here? Also, who plugged Karen back in? I haven't possessed a body in years! You can't do that! That's my body! Not anymore! <laughs> uh? I'm alive! This is basically what they build up to, which isn't a bad idea. I think the Dutchman pretending to be another character is a great idea. However, it's in the last part of this episode. So at most, this is one joke and an already pretty solid episode up to this point. All it does is show us what could have been. Not only that, but people get mad. I mean, look, I know that Plankton is a villain, and in this episode, he did attempt to steal the Krabby Patty secret formula, he needs some punishment to yada yada, but hear me out for a second. These people had nothing to do with Plankton, never visited his restaurant, never supported any of his ideas, and are side characters in some instances to other main character-centric episodes. And they're mad that he faked being dead. What time did he waste for many of you people? You guys had to have come here by choice. And something tells me that a lot of these people have better things to do. What emotions did he play with? You didn't care before, so logically, you shouldn't care now. The only person in story who should be upset is Karen. SpongeBob is pushing it, but I'll accept that as well. Maybe Patrick. Maybe Mr. Krabs. Karen is the only one in this story that seems to care for Plankton anyway, and I can see her beating the Flying Dutchman out of Plankton. However, that's not what happens. All of these randoms beat up Plankton, and I'm sitting here going, weren't you the lady who was upset at Squidward in the episode opposite day? I didn't see you throw any hands, or in this case, fins then. Anyway, the Dutchman leaves, Plankton gets his body, and he has a revelation. You know something? Ooh, it's great to be alive. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Ouch. I kind of find this endearing in a disturbing way that he'd rather live his life being squashed, but knowing what's real and what's not real, rather than living the Dutchman's life of having the scare not being able to interact with certain things, and to me, that's about as weirdly wholesome as someone giving a speech while getting stomped out can go. They add in another one of those Tombstone-esque cards, and that was the Ghost of Plankton. Finishing off Shanghai, the Flying Dutchman tells Spongebob and Patrick that he wishes to feast on them, as a way to get some usefulness out of him. Between this and the kids' comment earlier, the Flying Dutchman has solidified his status as a scary person in my eyes. Also, Spongebob and Patrick are surprised at this notion, which is endearing to see because to me, they came across as wanting to do the best job that they can, given the circumstances that they were unfortunately tied to. 
To me, they come across as lovable dudes, rather than insufferable. Because the mistakes they made didn't seem careless, but just short-sighted to try and please the person they were beholden to. They're competent enough to at least be clever with the way that they make mistakes, but not competent enough to be useful, and that's a thin line to tread. And early Spongebob knew exactly where that line was. Patrick then, using all of his brain power, comes up with the ultimate solution to what happens when you see toxic threads about animation on the internet. I have an idea. Really? What is it? Let's leave! Alright, so big conversation about Spongebob back when I started was that in rare cases they would use real life imagery and manipulate them in any way shape or form to fit a joke or a certain aesthetic that they were trying to reach. And what I like here is that it fits perfectly. Even though it's 2D images plastered on top of a real life place, there's many reasons why to me it never looks out of place. Firstly, they use a somewhat blurred version when Spongebob and Patrick are fully in it, so it never looks like Spongebob and Patrick are interacting with real objects. This way it looks like Spongebob and Patrick are in this impossible but possible parallel between a drawn 2D environment and a recorded 3D real life video, maintaining the feel of the former with the look of the latter. I also enjoy the fact that like with the zipper, it's random and on top of being random they clearly made it to stand out by adding in more towards the joke. Like with the zipper we see Spongebob and Patrick's face in horror and they clearly took more time to do that than for example the joke about the ship wanting to look good and scary. Likewise here, this is not something that you would see that they would do often, so when they do, and it's just for a throwaway joke, you're curious to see how far they would take it, and they actually go through with it. It stood out in a faster paced episode. Like here, you're allowed to sit back and watch something out of the blue that would be surprising to first time viewers. Everything about this was perfect, whereas if you take Rodeo Days for example, it's used for a song and the ending, but it's not blurred, and it's not a random joke, but a serious part of the plot. Which means they have to invest more time into making still images look like they're moving, which unfortunately always looks a little too weird for my liking. Here it's sharp, to the point, and even when you see things like arms or hands, it never takes away from their immersion. I mean, does any sponge or starfish truly look like they enjoy the perfume department? Also, there's just something about one of the last jumps, where Spongebob jumps over one perfume cloud and gets absolutely slapped by another that never gets old. They escape, find out that the Flying Dutchman needs a sock to eat, and get three wishes in order to fix their situation. Patrick used the first one, and I guess I just used the second one. Well then, the last one you owe me, because you got me back into this mess! Wait, I think it belongs to me, well, because I didn't really get a real wish! So why should you get a wish I didn't get a wish? Thank you. It's just rare to see Spongebob angry, not comically angry, but casually angry, if that's a term, just realistically aggressive without it being for comedy. It's almost as if a well-rounded character should have a lot of different emotions. So pause, because we have this opportunity, I also want to talk about the other characters and what the opportunity would have been if they were voted and we got to see their ending. But before I do, I really have to comment on Patchy here. So hoist your anchor off that couch and make with the voting. This is your big chance, and we'll be right back to announce the winners! He really brings out the best of his performances, at least pre-movie, with this episode. He's shown to be able to carry out a significant chunk of the episode without getting old, and this primitive but also most likely necessary aesthetic of random unconnected shots, old stock footage, and using static shots, but over the top effects gave Spongebob its post 90s aesthetic when it came to live action. However, we get to Patrick's ending. You are it! That's you, Patrick. Make your wish. Um... Wait, Patrick, listen. I do not particularly feel like being trapped here for all eternity. Eternity is a very long time, understand? Patrick, you've got to think harder than you've ever thought before. Come on, Patrick. Yeah, Come think, on. Think what think are really? you thinking, Pat? Come on. Yeah, you're doing it here. Come on, Patrick. Okay, I got it. That wish is granted. Oh, I'm sorry. Want some gum? You wished for gum. Well, if we're gonna be here forever, we might as well have fresh breath. Let us out! Don't be so mean. Ah, minty. Honestly, pretty lame. But to see the acceptance of eternal suffering is a mood. On to Squidward's ending. It's Squidward! 
bird, you get a wish. A great big wish. That's right. And you know what I wish? No. I wish that I had never met you two barnacle heads before in my entire life. So be it. Hi there, I don't believe we've met. My name is SpongeBob, and this is my associate, Patrick. Hi. That's not what I meant. Well, now that introductions are out of the way, it's time for dinner. And what did you say your name was? I'm Squidward. I'm your neighbor. Oh, nice to meet you. Also lame, but only because it doesn't make sense. He wishes that he never met them before in his entire life. To bend this, it also leans on the fact that Squidward hasn't lived the future yet, and thus it wouldn't count as his life. However, considering that he said entire, that should mean the future. Even so, why would you keep Squidward's memory? I feel like this could have worked out a lot better if all parties didn't know each other here. Both endings feel like a cheap cop-out to what could have been funny, really endearing, or character-defining endings. The ending we do see in all future airings of Shanghai is the one that has the most effort put into, which again makes me think that they either knew beforehand or fixed the votes, considering how similar the other endings are. I think it's a little disheartening, but not enough to throw off the awe I have thinking about a live event with alternate endings. Maybe that's just the Stanley Parable fan in me. It ends with Patchy ending the show and Potty quitting, which isn't seen again in re-airings, which means that Potty quitting got retconned. That was Shanghai slash You Wish. Obviously, I enjoy Shanghai more. It's one of my favorite episodes of SpongeBob. It's not that the ghost of Plankton is bad, however, there are more faults there. Shanghai just spoke a lot to the type of humor that I have, whereas the ghost of Plankton, while long overdue in terms of character pairings, seems a little dime a dozen for my taste. If I were to remove the bias from Shanghai, I'm pretty sure I can totally see why a lot of people would probably think the opposite, though. Anyway, special thanks to the patrons of March, and until next time. Take care. Alpha out.